So let us turn to John 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Our God is the only true God. Did you not have breakfast? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I know. Brandon, I'll give you extra bagel. But let's say it louder all together. Ready? Our God is the only true God. Our God is the only true God. You know why we do this every time, three times especially? It's because Peter, even after tasting all the miracles, witnessing and experiencing all the miracles that Jesus performed, when it mattered, he said, I don't know that man. I do not know that man. He denied Jesus three times. So we don't ever want to be in, our, in that situation where we will deny Jesus. So it's to counteract that, but not only that, to really uh, uh, accept and know him, uh, his attribute as manifested in the Bible. And that is, as John 17, 3 says, he is the only true God. Amen. Because he alone has the attributes that he has. He alone is that. And... There's only one way to know him. That's what makes him the only true God. So he alone has the attributes that he has, and there's only one way. There's only one way to come to him. And what is that only way? Yeshua, Yeshua as he said, I am the way. Hallelujah. So if you believe that God is the only true God, um, you are to believe that you have, uh, and you, have conf you are to confess that you have found the way to the only true God, the Heavenly Father. That you have found the only way, that one way, the only way to the Father's house. And again, as Yeshua, Jesus himself said, I am the way. So it's having found the way um, to him, uh, which means to have faith in him, to believe him for who he is. And if you have found this way, then it's not something that we find and we close it and tuck it away and then put it away and put it in our mind. Uh, but living faith life, living the faith is the faith life that we have to uh, live, which is to live a different life than the rest of the people in the world who have not found the way. So that means, unlike the people in the world who may have many options, many roads, many ways according to their uh, philosophy, their religions, their whatever um, uh, they may be, it's to have no other option but to walk on the path, on the way that we have found until arriving in the Father's house. That's what faith life is about. That's what the only way means. Amen? Uh-oh, this is a hard message. It's coming. Yes, it's coming. Because that's what Jesus said. That's what Yeshua said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So through me, he is indicating himself as the way. The way. And, and that way is a definitive way to the Father's house. And that makes him the only one, in fact. Yeshua is the only man who ever walked on earth who confidently indicated that he is the way. He alone is that. That's what makes him the only true God. Um, certainly, religious founder, religion, uh, founders of religions or philosophies, uh, uh, you know, whom the world or followers today may you know, believe in and trust in and look up to. None of them uh, confidently ever said that I am the way. I am the way to, you know, everlasting life, truth, or salvation. They could have lived a life that is exemplary to the followers um, and saying, you know, this is the teaching. This is how we ought to live. And then people say, oh, so you are our leader. You are our teacher. But none of them has ever confidently indicated that they were the way, meaning there are many ways, but that way, the way, is the only way. So when you say it's the um, or the way, it's to highlight that that is above all the others. Now, the uh, concept of way um, is, you know, um, 
we spent uh, during the time at the retreat uh, with the theme, the road to salvation, can be expressed in many terms, like way, uh, the way, or a way, or a path, a road. So these are, um, these are uh, the conditions to uh, move, you know, for us to move from point A to point B. And these conditions or these, um, you know, mechanisms or connecting points can be made certainly on the ground. So we have roads, many roads. The saying goes, many roads lead to Rome. Yeah, because the Romans were very good at building roads. And not only that, they, um, for thousand, uh, over a thousand uh, years, they uh, occupied a um, good part of Europe, um, you know, south, southern, and uh, even parts of, you know, they even went all the way to Germany. So the, the, the uh, empire spread, uh, and even to, part, uh, to Africa uh, and some parts of the Middle East. So the, all that um, was under the Roman ruling. So um, they were not only good at infrastructure, but they, oh, they, uh, they uh, ruled those lands. So they built roads to connect to their uh, kingdom uh, to allow themselves to travel. So all roads lead to uh, Rome, saying there are many, many roads. So when you, you know, fly uh, in the air, you can see so many roads uh, going everywhere. So it, eventually when you get on roads, uh, it will lead you somewhere. Now, if you drive uh, having a destination um, uh, without having any, uh, without having a destination or goal, you can be driving to California, you know, if you don't know where you're going, because the road, or I don't know who else, where, South America maybe, but all the roads lead to somewhere, uh, and, the, and they're all connected. Um, so there, it's critical for our travel on land, but also airways. There's something called airways, so air traffic uh, is now to maximum even. So... Um, you know, this is like a really sensitive area because, you know, people who are in the control tower, I hear that the funding is cut, so there's less people working. If there are less people working, who's directing the traffic in the air? Uh, because the pilots don't, you know, fly just at wherever they want. You'd think they might, but they don't. There's actually airways that they follow, and they have to follow signals and, and signals from the ground and all that um, so that they don't collide each other or collide into mountains or whatever. So there uh, are airways, but also waterways too. So um, ships or cargo ships or aircraft uh, carrier. These guys are all traveling. Yes, they're vast oceans, uh, many bodies of water, but they are expected to travel in certain paths because uh, that it's for safety and even for um, uh, you know uh, speed or efficiency so there are many many paths and waves uh, all these um, terrains if you will um, uh, these uh, levels of uh, places so that's one thing about a uh, way or path uh, and second uh, thing about it is that um, someone had gone there first to pave the way so um, you have this like expression pathfinder or a trailblazer, like you're thinking like car models. Ooh, trucks. Yeah, I think I know those. But, you know, they actually come from expression, like pathfinders. These guys are, peop these guys are people who are finders. Of, they have paved the road. They have made the path somewhere. So um, that work involves um, sacrifice. So this country being really uh, a large country, uh, it's really like the size of a continent, the United States. So um, from go to go from one end to the other, coast to coast, um, and I haven't done it on the road, but I hear that it's just amazing. It's just breathtaking because uh, you're so impressed with the highway system and just the vast land. But what we also have to take in is that somebody had gone there hundreds of years ago and sacrificed their way, uh, uh, you know, their lives in paving that road. Uh, because a lot of people did die, you know, making these roads. And just to, uh, you, I don't know if you heard, but I grew up hearing stories about the Lincoln Tunnel, like, because we used to travel there all the time. It's like, how many people have died? Maybe the descent, maybe Chinese immigrants have heard, like, your ancestors came and died building these, you know, tunnels. And, and they did, uh, and they did. So um, it's, it required a lot of risks, but people had died done it and they went ahead and made the sacrifice and because of that we can take advantage we can be uh, our lives can be convenient because of that so the key is that someone there was someone else who went ahead risking life to uh, pave the road and, and and then another thing about uh, way or path is that uh, there 
uh, for us to travel from a point A to B, there is a right path while there is a wrong path. So when you go on highways and when you drive, the sign says wrong way. So if you make a turn and it says wrong way, what do you do? You don't keep driving. I was like laughing because I remember Pastor King, I uh, was listening to her tape and many years ago and she was saying when she first came to New York, it was like decades ago, and she started driving around. And she had driver's license in Korea, but um, it's first time driving in New York. And New York, driving in New York period is just like very difficult and challenging, uh, even though back then uh, it was not as, you know, there weren't as many cars or many people, but still it was, uh, uh, you know, challenging. But she drove into Manhattan for the first time, and then uh, she thought that you, you could make right turn anywhere. So she just made a right turn one of the streets, uh, and then she turned, and it was like, oh, empty. Like, it's the middle of the day, and there's like nobody there. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this, this is good. I could get to my, you know, destination much earlier than I thought. And then she starts like, from far, like she sees, uh, what do you think of the um, uh, mirage or the mirage? Like it, it just from far, she sees some things happening. Some things happening in the in, the, in distance, and she looked closer and closer. They were getting closer and closer at her. Well, all these cars coming her way because she was facing the wrong way. Mind you, she was in a car, not walking, but she was in a car. Her car had already turned, and then there were cars coming at her, and she said she broke into cold sweats, and she had <laughs> That was not the brakes, but her tongue. So she was praying in tongues, and she made a fast U-turn to get back onto the other side, because if she had stayed there facing the wrong way, she would have been mowed down by these cars coming the right way, but she was in the wrong way. So anytime that we're in the wrong way, we have to quickly come to sense and turn around. So thankfully now we have GPS telling us that you're, you know, you need to turn around, turn around, turn around, turn around, they tell you. So um, when we are on the wrong path, we have to find our ways back to the right path. So those are uh, the ideas around uh, uh, ways and paths, and they're very, again, critical and necessary for our day-to-day uh, -day life. And there is a way, there, there is a reason why Jesus called himself the way. And um, there are many ways perhaps people think, to God and to arrive in a godly state, call it nirvana or heaven or heavenly place or uh, enlightenment or whatever people call it. But what Jesus is saying, what Jesus says to this day, is that there is only one way, and it is through him and him alone that one can go before God. Amen. That's certainly what the Bible says. I know not everyone here, and certainly many more people outside, do not believe that. But that's why we need to go to the Bible and understand who God is and how he worked to reveal himself. So to show the way to him, God made man uh, to be a spiritual being because God is spirit. His relationship with men is spiritual. So he made man not just of the flesh but also of the spirit by breathing into him his breath, the breath of life, and made him a living being. So the man became a living being. So let's look at Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Being. So the man became a living being, meaning of the flesh and of the spirit, dual beings. And the flesh is like man, like everyone else in the world. But spirit, uh, the living being, comes from God, so he has to go back to God. This is the way God made all men to be. So whether they know it or not, this is how we were made with this ancestor of ours. His name was Adam. So when Adam was made, which in Hebrew sounds like living being, he was made to live infinitely in the spirit, even though the flesh may live maybe 70, 80 years if lucky, maybe not. You know, so there's a limited time for the flesh. But this man, Adam, lived in the Garden of Eden, which sounds like a paradise on earth, but he was to be guided by the word of God that gave him limits to what he can do. And that was he could have everything and all things in the garden except for that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He told, God told him, if you eat of it, you will surely die. And that was the word for the spirit to obey. But he was deceived by the serpent that was in the garden, and he took that forbidden fruit. And that moment of disobeying the word of God is called sin. And when he sinned against God, he disobeyed the word of God, he was cut off from God. Because you see, sin does not mean like the quote-unquote bad things that you are thinking of, but sin is to be separated from God. Um, to separate from to be separated from the only true God, to not know the truth, not know him, not have the ability to go before him and not have relationship with him, not have the life that is in God. So to 
revealed this to Adam. God kicked him out of the garden. So at the end of chapter 3, we don't have time to look at all the verses, but at Genesis 3, at the end of that, we see Adam and Eve, both the man and the woman, are, uh, they're being banished out of the garden, and God puts a, uh, an angel to shield the garden so that the man would not come into the garden to take from the tree of life. What kind of tree? This tree is a different tree. There's the tree of the... Um, the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he was not supposed to eat, but he did. But then there is something called uh, the tree of life that he didn't touch. But God did not want him to have that, the tree of life. So that's why he put a shield, uh, which is a, of an angel, uh, to keep him from coming back to the garden, have his way to the tree of life. And that was to signal sin is to be cut away from the only true God. There is no way for you to know God. Come to God. Because sin is in the way. So sin is this shield. So one, once sin came to all men, all men died. Romans 5.12 says, and also 1 Corinthians 15.22 says. So sin and the price of sin came to all men in the spirit. Whether they knew it or not, this became the reality, the faith for all men. So sin, again, being the separation from God and the shield of the, around the garden being um, the the representation of this separation, um, continued uh, the history of mankind, but because they didn't know that, God, uh, plant, God began to do work to reveal that uh, state of being in sin and death. And that was by calling on a people to be his people. And that people were the people of Israel. Now, they were Hebrews. They were called the Hebrews. And they were slaves when God sent Moses to call them out. They were living in Egypt as slaves for four generations. But God sent Moses to bring them out to make them the people of God. But for them to come out of the slavery, you know, God like threw like fireballs called plagues, ten plagues, up to the nine plagues, which basically brought disaster, destruction uh, across the land of Egypt. Um, the Pharaoh didn't budge, but at the 10th, he raised his arm and he said, I give up. You guys go. And what was the 10th plague? It was the Passover night. What happened on the Passover night? Every firstborn human and livestock died. Unless, unless what? Unless they had the blood of the Passover lamb. So they were to slaughter a lamb and put its blood around the door frame. And when God saw that, Whoever was inside didn't matter. As long as there was blood that he was looking for, the spirit of death would pass over. So this is why the Jews to this day celebrate that occasion, because it marked the night that released them from their slavery. It was uh, by the blood of the Passover lamb. By what? So how did they leave Egypt? Was it by Moses? Was it by his staff? What was it by? By the blood of of which lamb? The Passover lamb. I want you to remember that. Keep that in the back of your mind because that, all the things of the Old Testament are copies or foreshadow of what will be coming uh, forth through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So once they were released out of their slavery, they went into, they follow Moses uh, into the promised land because God said, I will give you the land that I promised your ancestor. That land was the land of Canaan, a.k.a the current land of Israel, Jerusalem. But before they got to the promised land, they had to go through this phase of 40 years of traveling in the desert, in the wilderness. The wilderness is where you need a pathfinder. Get it? Because there are no roads. So you turn around and there is desert storm and then voila, it's gone. So it's like you lose your sense of direction because it's dust everywhere. Am I getting it right, vets? We have a lot of vets in this room who went to very vast de desert land out there in the Middle East. So it's like having no ray, no road, no path, and not knowing where you're going unless there is a leader ahead of you. And that's exactly what happened to these people thousands of years ago. It was Moses, but Moses was also so, so human. And they could not see him because there were two million of them who left. How can you see Moses? He's not on an elevator or airplane. How do you follow him? So how do they follow him? They follow the pillar of clouds by the day and the pillar of fire by the night. Usually the, but during the night they camped and the fire of light uh, was there to flame, uh, you know, a fire lit 
them and warm them up. But during the day, it was the pillar of clouds that went before them, and that was their like GPS, if you will, to follow the path. So in Psalm 77, 19, it says, you, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. First, before the wilderness, uh, what Psalm 77 is indicating is before they enter the, uh, the wilderness, they had to actually enter through the water, the Red Sea. And the one who made the way was God. God, uh, through Moses, uh, parted the sea and made a way for them to walk through the sea and enter the desert and made the way into desert as well. So here's God paving the way through the sea and paving the way through the desert. And that's what the Jews came to believe and be reminded by. So Deuteronomy 6.2, talking about um, God led you, the people of Israel, all the way in the wilderness. So the concept of way, the path of being led is repeated in the history of Israel because that was their history for, uh, for 40 years after the exodus, first into the Red Sea and into the desert life. So God commanded them to build a structure to remind them of this um, journey, this history, this part of their history. What did God make, tell them to make? The sanctuary, the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was made in the desert, and it was a structure where they served God, where they came to God, like sort of like church today, for those of you who are new to that concept. So coming to church means to come to, come to meet with God. So it was a physical structure, but had spiritual meaning, which was that they were coming to meet with God. But it was not all of the people of Israel coming in whenever they wanted. It was only the priests who were chosen out of the Levites uh, who were to come into the tabernacle. The tabernacle was divided into two spaces. Where were they? The holy place, which was the first outer room, and then after that, uh, in, in it there was a curtain, so there were, there, it was a tent, and then when they go through the first tent, the first room, the outer room was called the holy place, and then there was a, another curtain to get into the inner room, so behind the curtain was called the most holy place or the holy of holies. So the priests, the general priests, would serve God in the outer space called the holy place throughout the year. And there were structure like uh, items like the lampstand and the table, uh, the bread, um, the table of showbread and the altar of incense. So these were all the vessels that were there to use, uh, to be used to serve God, to worship God. And behind the curtain was the most holy place where only who? The high priest, how many times a year? Once a year. Wow. This is why people say, like, your people know the Bible so well. You do because, you know, unless you're like Old Testament scholar, you don't really know this. Yeah. So consider yourselves very blessed. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So in the most holy place, only the high priest went in once a year. With what? With sacrifice called the blood. The blood of sacrifice, the offering, the blood of animal. He would bring to God representing the entire people of Israel to meet with God, to speak with God. Certainly there was the Ark of the Testimony in there to represent God's presence, mercy seat, where he would speak to the people. So all that was to represent their journey. How did that all represent? Before the tent uh, or the tabernacle, it was actually inside a structure called the tent. So it was an outside perimeter um, in the shape of like a box, but with opening like entrance. There was a courtyard. So the courtyard, the first thing that was there, that one would see would be the altar of burnt offering. So this is sort of like where they burned up the fat, the meat uh, from the sacrifice. Um, So that was where the blood was separated and poured at the altar. So that was to remind them the Passover lamb. How are they free today? How are they alive today? How are they existing to this day as a people? Because of the blood of the Passover lamb. We are alive today. So that's how you begin, by the blood. And then after that, before the priest went into the tabernacle, right outside the outer curtain, the entrance of the tabernacle, was a bronze basin. And it was, uh, it was to contain what? Water. So water basin was outside, and it was for them to wash their hands or their face to look at their uh, reflection to be clean before going before God. So that water represents for the Jews what? For the Hebrews or the people of Israel? The Red Sea. They had to go through the Red Sea because God made the way for them to go through the Red Sea. Then they went into what? 
the desert, and that's the holy place where they follow the pillar of clouds and fire, the lampstands. Ooh, yes, all connected, right? So those of you who have learned some of that in your Bible study or logos, you know what I'm talking about there. And then finally, the veil. Veil represented the last passage going before the promised land. So before the, after they finished the journey in the desert, the people of Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, because Moses now died, he couldn't cross this last passage. They went, they went through and they went to the land of Canaan. What was the last passage they had to go through? The river, another river, the Jordan. Yeah, so the, uh, they, had, they had to go through the sea or a uh, river. They had to um, follow uh, Joshua into the land by going through the Jordan. So that was the last passage and that repre- what was represented through the veil in the uh, sanctuary, and after that, they finally arrived in Canaan, which was the most holy place. So that is all represented uh, in the Old Testament in Exodus 25, 26, with the structure of uh, the sanctuary. But for us, let's go to Hebrews 9, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 7. But only the high priest entered the inner room that only once a year, never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. So now when you look at verse 7, that summarizes what I had just told you, right? So the high, only the high priest, only once a year, only with the sacrifice, with the blood, and only in the sanctuary, but this is the sanctuary that's earthly, that's made by hands, made by men, that the people of Israel will meet with God. So none of the individual Israelite met with God. It was only the, whole, uh, the high priest representing them meeting with God. And when God accepted the sacrifice and the high priest uh, spoke with God and lived and came back out and said, The Lord forgives you. You are forgiven. Your sins are atoned for. God bless you. Then the whole people waiting outside the tabernacle said, Hallelujah. Now we don't have to worry about the price of sin. We don't have to worry about curse or death. He has received our worship. He's going to bless us. And we can live the coming year by his blessing, right, by his grace. So this is how they understood to serve God, to go before God, to have relationship with God. The only way for them was in this structure, the earthly sanctuary, the earthly tabernacle. So only in the physical tabernacle that God designated because that was where his name was. What was that? The name Jehovah, the name of the I am God. And that's where the blood of the Passover lamb was shed. That's where God spoke with the high priest. That was where they had relationship with God. That was the only way. But then you go to verse 8. It says, the way into the most holy place had not yet been open, not yet been disclosed. So what is that? Right? So those are a contradictory, uh, contradicting statements. On the one hand, we see that that was the way for the Jews. And then the other says is it has not been open. So what the writer of the, he- the book of Hebrews is saying is the way to the true most holy place, the true place, the true tabernacle where the only true God is, has not been open yet, as long as this first tabernacle was standing, meaning this structure was standing in the land among the people in the Old Testament. That is indicating of another temple coming, a new temple, a new tabernacle, new sanctuary to be established by the Son of God named Yeshua. So the true way would be open only then. So while this was happening, uh, and the people took pride because no, with no other people God made co- covenant, no other people on earth could go before God. They, do not, they did not have this kind of relationship with God. Only the people of Israel, only the children of Abraham. So think of the pride and the dignity that these people had. But on the other hand, the prophets had warned them. Because people were tempted to go astray. Remember, I I talked about ways. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. There's the path of righteous and there's the path of unrighteous, the path of the wicked. So that's what Jeremiah 21 verse 8 warned the people. It says, this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. You have to choose either the way of life or the, the, the way of death. 
Isaiah 26 verse 7 says, The path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, make the way of the righteous smooth. So indicating that God is the righteous one, the upright one, that he is going to send someone to make the path straight and that we are to follow and walk on that path of the righteous. Psalm 1 once says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, in the seat of mockers. So the blessed man does not walk on the path of the wicked. So in the Old Testament, there are all these prophecies about warnings. Do not walk on the path of the wicked. Do not go on the way of death. Instead, choose the way of life. Choose the path that leads to life. Choose the path of the righteous and the one who will pave this path of life, the path of the righteous. righteous. Who is that? It is Yeshua, the Son of God. So naturally, standing before the temple, Remember, the tabernacle was the only way, right? The only place. But later on with Solomon, when they went into the, tab- uh, in the um, promised land, the tabernacle was no more. It was then built into a permanent structure like ours, like a building called the Temple of Jerusalem. So standing before this Temple of Jerusalem, the one who referred to himself as the Son of God, a.k.a. Yeshua, what did he say? Destroy this temple! Uh Uh-oh, destroy this temple. So now all this was to set up for you to really fathom like what he, what the meaning that he had. There was only one way because there were times where people were trying to give sacrifice to God in other places, but God did not receive sacrifice from other places, but the sanctuary, but the temple. God only accepted through the high priest chosen from the line of Aaron within the Levites not other lines, even the same tribe. As you know, the story of Korah, number 16, Korah and his sons and so on, who rebelled against God. So God is, and even the fire that was used, had to be from the particular one, particular place that God designated. It's the only way, only way. So it was instilled in the Jews. And looking at the temple, they knew that even as they were being occupied, yes, the famous Romans, they were occupying Jerusalem at the time. They, that were clinging onto the temple because that's the only way they can worship God. They could, that's the only way they can remain as the people of God. That's the only way they can perhaps be restored as a kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom of Israel. And here is a man in their eyes, a mere man saying, destroy it. Naturally, they wanted to kill him. Yes, so the high priest, yes, the, the high priest, the chief priest at the time, were the leaders in conspiring to put Jesus to death. But what Jesus was referring to was not about the temple that was made by hands, but was referring to the temple of his body. He was referring to, I will de- you will destroy it, but in three days, I will raise it in three days. So three days, I'll raise it back up. So I will be risen to life, he was saying. So you'll put me to death, but in three days, I will resurrect. So he was talking about the temple of his body. Hallelujah. He was already prophesying in John 2, 19 about his death and his resurrection. You will kill me, but I'm not going to end up dead. I will be risen to life. And you will know that the only true God has now come as man. Hallelujah, the one who was with God in the beginning as the word to manifest himself, manifest God, to manifest his attributes in, the, in the, a bodily form. Jesus had come, the word has become flesh, and he was going to reveal that through his death and his resurrection. So through that, he was going to now make a way Make a way to the only true God that none of the high priest or the priest or the tabernacle or the animal sacrifice could do, but that he would become the way to the only true God. So when Jesus came, I do want to clarify that it wasn't the entire God who became man. It was the part of God who was planned to be manifested as man. The word, John 1, 1, who was with God in the beginning, became flesh, became man so that men may know and come to the only true God, that he would become the way, the only way to him. So not the way to the most holy place in the temple, not the way to the land of Canaan, but the way to heaven, the Father's house. Hallelujah. Until then, they could not fathom 
a pathfinder to heaven. They could not. The closest they could get to was the temple because that was the place of God. That's where his name was, and that's where blood was shed. That's where God spoke. That's where God blessed. And that's as close as they could get, imagining, imagining how the, close they can get to God. But here is Yeshua, the Son of God, coming and saying, I'm going to make a way to heaven, the Father's house. I will become the way. I will make the way, open the way for you. So that's what Hebrews 9. Let's go back to Hebrews 9. Verse 11 and verse 24. Chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. So here is saying it's comparison in contrast to the human high priest that went through the veil on earth to the most holy place on the earthly sanctuary. But what the writer here is saying is, no, that's not where Christ went through. Christ went through a better, more perfect tabernacle, a greater tabernacle. What are we talking about? That is not of part of this creation. Where? That is the one in heaven that he will make a way through his body that is the temple and make a way for himself to first enter and make a way for all men to follow him amen verse 24 for christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one he entered heaven itself now to appear for us in god's presence hallelujah now do you understand I know it's a lot of uh, Old Testament base today, but nevertheless, it's important. I know it's difficult, and a lot of you are going like, oh, this is way too much, like slow down. But we have to know the basis of our faith. It comes from the Word. And where is Jesus? He's not just in the New Testament. The entire Bible testifies about him. With the New Testament, we don't have Jesus, meaning we don't have Jesus to be testified as who he is. That is that he is God, Christ, the Son of the living God. With the Old Testament, we don't have evidence. With the New Testament alone, we need the Old Testament and see how he fulfilled every part of the Old Testament. Amen? So that's why we are reviewing this. So now understanding this, Jesus is referring to the the heavenly place, the heavenly house of the Father that he will make a way to. Because remember, what happened with Adam that men cannot go to God? He sinned. And remember that the flaming sword, that shield at the, the, the Garden of Eden, represents the wall of sin that separated men from God. So sin is the separation from God. And if you're separated from God, you don't come to God. And if you don't come to God, what happens to you in the end? You go to hell. Simple as that. I just spell it out clearly. Yes. If you're with God, you stay with God, you go to heaven. But if not, you end up in hell because that's the price of sin, death of the spirit in the fire of hell. But Jesus came, God, who was planned to be manifested from the beginning as the word he was there with God, now finally came to lay down his life to become the way to the Father. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that was going to be completed through his death and his death alone. That's why even after raising the dead, multiplying food, performing miracles, calming the sea, driving out demons, when it came to his own arrest and death, he did not perform any miracles. It was not because he became helpless, he ran out of power or courage, but it was according to the command of the Father, John 10, 17, 18. So this was command he received from the Father to lay down his life willingly. Only then he will fulfill, finish his race. So when he died on the cross, what did he say? He said, what did he say? It is finished. You know when the Olympic Games finish? With the marathon. Right? Like the finishing, the punctuation, the end of the race. There are many, many multiple games going on at the same time. But the, the jewel crown, this is the marathon. They'll put the end to the race. All races end with that, ga- with that race. So the race, the path, The way for Yeshua, the Son of God, was to the cross. So God who was in the beginning, through 
through him, through whom all things were made, became man, came as man. The word became flesh. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwell among us. The word became flesh. God became flesh. God became man. God was born a baby, laid in a manger, a cradle. So from the cradle, he went to the cross. His path was already determined when the word was in the beginning. His path, his way was already determined when the word was with God in the beginning. So when the word was there and God said, I'm going to reveal myself as the word. This is the way I'm going to reveal myself because there's no other way to know me but through the word, except through the word. And there's no other way to come to me except through the word. And the word that became flesh, the incarnate word, is Yeshua, the son of God. And the way he was going to also finish his path of revealing the father was at the cross. From the cradle to the cross in his death. The path was determined and he walked on it to the end. So we tend to think like for 30 years he lived an ordinary man. For three years he lived his public life as, as, as Christ. And then he finally died. And his suffering must have been like, you know, the night he was arrested. He was beaten and spat on and punched. And then finally, you know, punctured and whipped and crucified. It was not just those hours that he suffered. I, and, and I'm not to take away from the suffering of the crucifixion. But the word coming as man and being born as man is the lowest point that God became. It's the lowest, the most humble form, the form that God could ever imagine to become. He did. And that was the way for him to return to the Father, fulfill the Father's will, to reveal that the Father alone is the only true God. Even though Yeshua, Jesus himself, is God, he humbled himself and became nothing to the point of death on a cross. And the cross was the finish line for his path, his way, his life. Hallelujah! So only at that moment, he said, it is finished. Because it was the moment of his death. With that moment, he would surrender everything. Now the rest is in the hands of the Father. The rest means the way of life. He chose and walked and kept and finished the way of death. Remember what Jeremiah, Isaiah, Psalm, all talking about the way of life, way of death. The way of death he walked on first, but it ended at the cross as he breathed his last. The only thing that was left was the way of life, the way to life. And the only true God the Father would give to him, lead to him, to, through his resurrection to life. Hallelujah. And through that, the Father received glory as the only true God. There's only one way to him, and that is through the Son, Yeshua. And by doing so, he tore down the gates of Hades. He tore down the gates of the fallen angel, Satan, the devil, the origin of sin, the origin of sin who caused man to sin because he himself was sin in the spiritual heaven. He became proud and sinned against God, and God cast him out of the spiritual heaven, contained him in the universe, where until this day of great judgment, he would be contained, and he was ruling over the world as the ruler of death, and with the power of death, he was doing so. And he had the greatest uh, dominion, authority in the universe. But until this moment, he did. But once his flesh tore, Jesus' flesh tore, it was the moment of tearing the wall of sin. Remember the wall of sin, the shield around the, the garden. But not only that, John, uh, Genesis 1-2 talks about the Spirit of God hovering. Where? The surface of the water. Logo students, you know what I'm talking about. In the second universe, second heaven of the universe. The Spirit of God hovering so that the fallen angels contained cannot escape. So this place will become burning hell. No one can escape. 
because of sin, because of the wall of sin. But when his flesh tore, the gate, the, the shield became torn. Not the entire shield, but just enough for those who would gain the confidence to walk on the path made by the blood of Yeshua can go through. As Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. You will come in and out of me. You will come through me. As he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. To come to the Father, you have to go through me. Hallelujah. By condemning the origin of sin, he tore down the wall of sin. So by shedding his blood through his torn flesh, which is described as the veil, when he died, Matthew 27 says, the temple veil tore. You've seen in the movie, The Passion of Christ, when Jesus died on the cross, there was the shaking of the ground, and the temple veil tore. So what does that represent? These veil, the shield, the hovering, all of them represent the wall of sin. The holy place was, the most holy place was shielded, covered, hidden from the rest of the Israelites because they're sinners. Sinners cannot come to God. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in church. It doesn't matter if you give many, many sacrifices. It doesn't matter if you've been a good boy, a good girl. It doesn't matter what you do because you have sin inside your spirit. You can do nothing about that. You can't even do anything about the sins of desire that just rise from your mind and your flesh because no one is righteous, none. Not even one. That's why he made a way for us through his torn flesh by shedding his precious blood that is not of the perishable but the imperishable, the precious blood of the lamb that is without flaw, that is without stain, wrinkle. Only by his blood we can gain the confidence to walk on, travel on, travel through to enter the Father's house. Hallelujah. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. Hallelujah. Whose body are we talking about? The body of Yeshua that tore on the, on the cross. And it says the most holy place. To enter the most holy place. What is that place? What, the temple of Jerusalem? We're not going there. We don't need to go there anymore. That's why he said, Tear it down. We don't need it anymore. God is not served here. You don't meet God in the temple. God is not the God of Jews anymore. The God who is the only true God is God for all, all men in Adam. And for his spirit, we come before him as spirit. And the way we go is not by the works that we do, the good things that we try to do. No. It is not by what we try, but it is only by a new and living way open for us. That is the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we go, we are coming together to enter the most holy place in heaven, the Father's house. Hallelujah. That is our ultimate goal. But for us to get there, Jesus himself finished his way at the cross and breathed this last and he died. But the way of life was open for him. The father in three days raised him back up to life. And Yeshua resurrected, hallelujah, from heaven to earth, from earth to the cross, from cross to the grave, from grave to life. And finally he ascended to heaven, hallelujah. And that is where he is seated to this day and forever. He is seated on the throne as the King of kings, the risen Lord. And we serve him today as we gather together in his name as members of his body until we arrive in the Father's house, hallelujah. It is from there the Holy Spirit came in the name Yeshua. Jesus in English, Yeshua in Aramaic and Hebrew, which means he will save his people from their sin. So whosoever calls on his name will be saved. Call upon his name and you'll be saved. Receive his name. Believe in his name to be the name of God, the name of the Savior. And you will receive the right to become his children. Say amen if you have become a child of God. Do you believe you have a father in heaven? And his name is Yeshua. And the Holy Spirit comes to souls as such as ours. 
and testifies in us that Yeshua alone is the way. Amen? Yeshua is alone. He alone is the way because he alone knew where he was going. He alone knew where he came from, and he alone knew where he was going. But what do you mean about that? I know where I'm going. Yeah, you know how to go home. You know how to get to work. You know how to come to church. You know the ways on the road. You know the ways maybe of your life. But even that, you don't quite know. You came from your parents, but your parents, what about before that? Their parents, their parents. You don't know. You only know what you know. And you can't foresee what's coming. No man knows where he is going. Because no one has ever gone beyond death and came back to tell us. No one. Except Yeshua. Only Yeshua has come back from the dead to show us that he is the way. That his word came true through his resurrection. He testifies that his word is true. That's why he said, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, meaning that he was going to die, but he will be risen to life and reveal that he is the life, that whoever believes in him, even though he may die, he will live again. That even though when he's alive, you believe, you will never die. That he is the resurrection to life. He is the way. Because through resurrection to life, that one would receive eternal life. One would go to heaven, live with God, live like God forever. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit in us testifies that. No man, no Buddha, no Allah, no Mary, no Pope, no one else. No man. Absolutely none. On earth, under the earth. Nowhere in this world is there such man, the son of man. Christ, the son of the living God. Who alone knew where he was going. And he knew that he who came from heaven, came to earth from the cradle, went to the cross but did not end up in cross, even though his breath ended there. It was after the cross he received the crown. From cradle to the cross to the crown. So as they said, the saying goes, not before the cross. Crown is only after the cross. The cross is before the crown. And that's the path that he paved his life. His life was already determined, and he never went astray. He stayed on track every moment of his life. And even as he was dying, such brutal but also shameful and despised way, which was to become sin, he never doubted for a moment. Am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right way? Am I in the right place? He never doubted. He knew that as long as he stayed on course, he stayed on this route, that once he finished his race at the cross, the Father would raise him up. The Father will save, me from, save him from this place of death and bring back to him to life. And that he would enter the Father's house, the most holy place, the better, the greater tabernacle, that of heaven. And reign there forever and ever. Hallelujah. And that he would become the high priest who would go before us, paving the way for us to follow. So that the Holy Spirit lets us know that the only way to heaven is Yeshua. Amen? Amen. The only way to heaven is Yeshua. Let's say it together. Yeshua is the only way. He was the first to walk on this path, the path of tears and suffering, path of his blood. And it is he who said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross and follow me. Take up their cross and follow me. What does the cross mean? The cross is the ultimate form of self-denial. The cross is the ultimate form of self-denial.
denial. We're not making a cross to hang there. We're not trying to beat our bodies for the sake of religiosity or self-purification. But Dale, to take up our crosses and follow our cross and follow him to is to deny ourselves while we're in the flesh we are struggling against our flesh our warfare is against the desires of the flesh we are fighting against evil spirits demons diseases perhaps opposing powers or influences but the ultimate fight is against ourselves it is our bodies that crave to do things that the world loves to do to seek the pleasures of the flesh that's what the flesh wants to do the flesh wants to, to sleep to stay sleep to be lazy to do whatever it wants to do to touch things to eat things to do things to see things to have things to enjoy a, a life of easiness and, and safety and security and comfort. That's what the flesh wants to do. But Yeshua said, Who want, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Say no to the world and say yes to the cross. In that sense, entering the Father's house is not for all, it seems. Even though on the one hand, John 3.16 says, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's easy. It seems easy. But when he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, what is a disciple? A disciple is he who follows and lives the life of his teacher, his leader. Who is our teacher? Who is our leader? It is Yeshua, our Savior, our Lord, our King, our pathfinder, our trailblazer. He is our pioneer who paved the road, who laid the way to the Father's house in his blood. And the cross was his way. And the cross was the way for all his disciples. All his disciples. All but one. Who denied him, who betrayed him, took his own life and became a son of destruction to go to hell. But the rest all followed his path to the cross. They all died following the footsteps of their teacher, their leader, their king, Yeshua. Because they believed that when they followed him, they would not end up dead, but that the way of life was waiting for them after the way of death, the crown. The people of Israel began their journey by starting with the blood of the lamb, went to the Red Sea, because the Lord provided them path to walk the sea as if they were walking on dry land. And they entered a desert, pathless way, roadless place, because the, the Lord was with them and made path there even. And they went through the Jordan and finally entered the promised land. And that was only a shadow of what Jesus, Yeshua himself, will go through. He himself came to the world and was born a baby, came as man, laid in a cradle, in a manger. And he, wa he was baptized. After he was baptized, he lived a life of suffering and ultimately finishing his way of death, the way to death at the cross. But after the cross, it was the Father who led him to the way of life. By crowning him, the crown of glory, the crown of life through his resurrection. And because of which he's, he was lifted up high to the heavenly place and is seated on the throne to this day and forevermore. And today, the true Christian, therefore, like Peter and Paul, who willingly chose to follow 
Christ. And when they chose, there was no other option but to follow him in his path to the cross. Now, some of you, and there are many young people here too, what do you mean the cross? I'm too young to carry a cross. The cross is denying yourself, as I said. As the Bible, as the word tells us, do not love the world. You cannot love the world and keep walking this path. You cannot keep being the self the way you are and then expect to go to the Father's house. You have to put yourself to death. We began by baptism, which was to bury our old self. Our old self that was doomed to death because of sin we inherited, because of sin we, we committed in the past. We bury, we die with Christ. To be risen to life with him as, as we came out of the water. That until then, I have to continue my journey on the journey that he went ahead of me. It's already spelled out. It's already mapped out where I'm supposed to walk. And that's to never stray from it and never regret my choice. Never looking back, never going back. But to say, I have decided to follow you. No turning back. No looking back. And for me to get to the Father's house, to being crowned and enthroned around him, next to him. I have to live a life of denying myself of the things that my flesh wants to do. The flesh wants to have an easy life, easier life, more comfortable life, more secure life. But the way of the cross is to say no to that. Obeying the word of God today in this life, in my life, is difficult. To say no to the world and your worldly friends and to come to church, it's difficult. To stay in the church of Jesus and keep up with all the demands. You have to do dedication. You've got to come to practice. You've got to go pray. You've got to evangelize. You've got to, you got to give offering. You've got to do this and this and this and that. Yes, it is hard. Because this is to say no to my old life. But can I just go both ways? There is no both ways. There is no both way. There's only one way. And Jesus has shown us. You see, the cross is not a symbol or a thing we wear on our necklace or on our necks or even tattoo on our bodies and feel good about it. And that it's like I'm a Christian, or somehow it's gonna bring you good luck, or somehow God's gonna give you some kind of pointer because you're wearing a cross around your neck. The cross is the way of life. And we repent because we're not denying ourselves enough. That we have failed to carry the cross. It is to say no to the world, to say no to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. It is to say no to my old plans and my old ambitions. But this was my plan. I'm supposed to do this and this and this and that. And when I have secure everything and ready everything, then I will follow you. What did Jesus say? Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go proclaim the kingdom of God. In fact, those people who said, let me go and do business and let me prepare and then I'll come back and follow you. Jesus said, okay, go. Don't follow me. You're not worthy of me. You're not worthy of me. How can he say that? He paid the highest price. The cost, it cost his life on the cross. But yet when people say, well, I'll follow you. I'll volunteer, but I'll fill up your kingdom. But can you wait a minute? Jesus didn't say, oh, sure, I'll wait a minute. No, he said, no, you're not worthy of me. Go home. You see, his glory is not minimized or decreased because one less person follows him. You understand? Just because one more person fills up kingdom, he becomes greater. No, he already is glorious. He already is great. There is no one like him. He alone is who he is, that he is the king of kings, the greatest one of all. Hallelujah. I'm just honored to know him, to know him, and that I made the choice to follow him. And even if this path may be narrow, Jesus said, 
enter, Matthew 7, 13 to 14, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Only a few find it. Only a few will find it and only even fewer will stay on it and finish it. Who is the small gate? Who is the narrow road? It is Yeshua. It is he who walked on it first. And he dripped all his blood, spilled all his blood on that road, on that path. It is that way, that path we walk on today. To come before him, to worship him. Only by grace. It is that path that I have walked today. To have to, to, to dare to dream to go to heaven. It is only that way that I could come before him and pray to him. Therefore, it's the only way for me to stay walking and following until my finish line. That is the cross, my death, or his return. But I have to ultimately arrive at this death so that the only thing that is waiting for me after that is the way to life in the Father's house. I want us to all think about what is that I have to say no to. In fact, there are so many things we have to say no to. Self-denial. This is why the Holy Spirit helps us. This is why we cling on to prayer. We start each day in prayer, desperately seeking his help. Help me this day to deny myself and carry my cross to follow you. That I do it willingly, I do it joyfully, and I do not look any other way, go astray, but I stay on track until I arrive in the Father's house where I will finally see you face to face. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Who are Christians? Christians are those who confess that they were once lost, but now they have been found. Once blind, but now they see. But it is not to say, thank you. Let me go on living my dream. Let me go on and pursue my success, prosperity, wealth, and happiness in the world. But once knowing that he has been found, the Christian now stays following the Lord until receiving that salvation in the Father's house, that eternal life. Until then, we are to press on, press on and not look back. Oh, Lord, give me the strength. Give me the strength to go on and this determination to say no to the world, no to the desires of my flesh, the, the lust of the eye and pride of life, but to say yes to the cross and finish this path. Yeshua! Yeshua!